Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and the children another generation. Now, have you ever seen anything like this? Uh, this is something you're going to talk uh, to your grandchildren about, your children, your children's children, because there's never been anything quite like it. And of course, it was a disaster on a national level that was affecting uh, Joel's generation. We read about this barrenness in chapter 2 uh, of Joel and verse 3. It says, A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them. And behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. And so uh, definitely a crisis on a national scale. Uh, as I speak to you, we are facing a crisis on a global scale. We could say, has there ever been anything like that in our days? I don't remember anything. Uh, and I'm sure other ones even older than me can't remember anything quite like this. Uh, Joel, as he thought about his day, he encourage the people to come together in a solemn assembly. Sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders, all the inhabitants of the land, into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. And he encouraged them to come together for a solemn assembly. And I think as we think of our day, uh, where we are experiencing spiritual barrenness. Uh, our lives are not as fruitful as God intended them to be. Uh, there's spiritual barrenness. Uh, I think it would be, be fair to say that we're, we find ourselves in days of barrenness. So what does Joel say? He asked them to come together in brokenness. Perhaps what the Lord would like for us to do this week is to come together and with all of our hearts, seek the Lord. Yes, maybe some tears because of the barrenness spiritually in our lives, maybe caused by spiritual apathy, uh, maybe because of immorality, lack of forgiveness. I don't know the causes, but, but we do know we're living in a time of barrenness and God would ask us to come before him uh, in brokenness, weeping, mourning, rending our hearts, not our garments, turning to the Lord your God, that we might move from barrenness to incredible blessing, to turn a barren landscape into a fruitful landscape for the glory of the Lord Jesus. Psalm 119.37 Turn my eyes away from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. Are you not our God? Man, I love that. Are you not our God? If disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in, in our affliction, and you will hear and save. It happened that the people of Moab, with the people of Ammon, and others with them besides the Ammonites, came to battle against Jehoshaphat, saying a great multitude, overwhelming army that was coming upon them, that they were helpless, that they were going to be slaughtered, that this was a huge problem. So he responds in fear to an incredibly huge, insurmountable problem. So what is our huge problem today? Uh, we have a country that is rapidly running from God. Um, fruitlessness is, is too uh, much an issue among the people of God. Complacency is too much an issue among the people of God. Apathy, um, prayerlessness is too much an issue amongst the people of God. In James chapter 4, the scripture equates prayerlessness with adultery. Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord when they were terrified, rightfully terrified. The leader of the people of God, right? He said that we have a huge problem. We must seek God. 
when we come into his presence, when we set our face to seek him, boy, he meets us in that place and he leads us on that we have a God who hears and we have a God who saves. The God who they cried out to in their need is the God who we cry out to in, in our need. That Jehoshaphat, he looked back to Abraham and he said, you are our God. We're doing the same thing. We're looking back to Jehoshaphat and saying, that is our God. God, who at sundry times and in divers' manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed the heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty and high. This is the one who is God. Uh, when we see the Lord Jesus Christ, we see the glory of God. Uh, the glory of God is revealed in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who created, he made the worlds. We see tremendous worth being attributed to the Lord Jesus. We've seen that the Spirit has declared that He is God. We've seen that the declaration of the Father uh, is that He is the glory of God. He is the heir of all things. He is the Creator. He is the Savior. And today He's in the place of the finished work. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the, se the seals thereof, for thou wast slain. This is the qualifying uh, element the Lord Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross, his substitutionary sacrifice for sinners on the cross is the element that qualifies him to take the book and to open the seals. But it also tells us what was achieved as he was slain and has redeemed us to God <coughs> by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth and so he is worthy he's worthy because he was slain uh, he's worthy uh, because he was able to bring sinners into a place of fellowship with himself with God and not only that it is by his blood by his shed blood he has redeemed sinners. Those who were his enemies, he has redeemed by his blood. And not only that, but he's worthy because he was able to take these redeemed ones and make them kings and priests. And also because of what he has done, he is worthy because they will reign with him on the earth. The Father spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. What wonderful approbation from heaven. Heaven declares the worthiness of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's worthy in his obedience. He's worthy as God. He's worthy to receive all things. He is worthy. And it's only as we understand him as heaven understood him and it's only as we appreciate him and see his worth as heaven saw it that we will have that overflowing heart of worship you see all heaven declares the worth of the lord jesus ought not we the people of the lord be better more intense more urgent in doing the same when we worship, the outflow, the overflow of worship 
should be in service to the Lord. What is worship? It is worth-ship. There are two big ideas that are brought together with this word. Primarily, our response to the discovery of the Lord in his fullness and the commitment with which we respond. What we have here then is every possible qualification for worthiness, blessing, his personal wealth, and the generosity with which he shares it, honor, his exalted position due to the esteem in which he is deservedly held, glory, his personal splendor in the unfolding of the perfections of his character, wisdom, his infinite knowledge and its perfect application in every instance, and power, the authority he wields and the absolute right to use it. We've been chosen in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame, notice, before him, before him. This is a common phrase in the early books of our Bible, the idea of being before the Lord. The sacrifices were offered before the Lord and the menorah shone before the Lord and the showbread was before the Lord. And the idea is that God wants intimacy. He wants to draw us near to him, but he also wants us to take responsibility. He's called us to be sons in the family business, and he's given us these tremendous privileges as we draw near to him to represent him, to serve him. And so we who are the recipients of his blessing then become the vehicles of his blessing to those around us. The heavenlies are a place of honor, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's astounding, isn't it? Honor for him, yes, absolutely. But he has welcomed us into this place of honor and is seating us with him in that glorious place. What should be our response to this? If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's Colossians 3, 1 to 3. In other words, act as if you've already left this world behind. If he's come to share them with us, that the heavenlies are a place of blessing and glory and honor and wisdom and power, what should we do? Well, the first one says we should draw near to Christ. We should take the responsibility of reflecting Christ. We should seek after what pleases Christ. We should hold up Christ as the answer to every dilemma of the human condition. Follow Christ into battle Glory alone for Christ alone. Jesus Christ is head. He is head of the church, his body. And so when I think of that position of the Lord, I always think of Colossians chapter one. It says this, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So what's it like in North America these days as far as Jesus Christ having his proper place? Well, it seems to me that many are distracted in the North American church. We're distracted by all the different attractions of the world. We need people that discern the times that understand the times that we're in and are men of might men fit for the battle, ready to go forward in the battle with the Lord Jesus. Does anyone know what time it is? This is our generation. We've been put here for a purpose. We've been put here intentionally. It, you know, it's not a time to play it safe. It's not a time to be quiet. 
It's not a time to blend in. And it's certainly not a time to sleep. You say, well, brother, what time is it? It's time to awake out of sleep. William Gurnall says this, since the devil never sleeps, the Christian puts himself in grave danger by falling asleep spiritually. Satan will be upon him before he's awake enough to draw his sword. You should be aware that the saint's sleeping time is Satan's prime tempting time. Now, standing implies this. Standing implies watchfulness. Like you, you, Sleep certainly doesn't imply watchfulness. You can't watch when you're sleeping. But standing implies watchfulness, and the scripture puts those two thoughts together oftentimes. It says things like this, Watch ye and stand fast in the faith, Paul told the Corinthians. Distraction is eliminated when we wake up, when we stand up, and when we look up. I've been thinking of him, the Lord Jesus, as Lord. We've been thinking of him high and lifted up. And so how did the Lord Jesus use the body that had been prepared for him? He said it repeatedly, I have come to do your will, O God. As members of the body of Christ, we are no less bound to do the Father's will in our earthly ministry than the Lord Jesus was bound to do his Father's will in his earthly ministry. The body is always to be the servant of its head, not the other way around. Our head is Jesus Christ. Thus, everything we do must flow out of his coordination, his authority, his direction. There's no room for our will to be inserted into the agenda. God is looking for men and for women who are committed to doing all his will. These are remarkable days in which we are living, days that uh, I've never seen before, my father had never seen, my grandfather had never seen. And I believe that if there was ever an, a, an opportunity to buy up or redeem, I'm convinced it's this one. And just as the Lord Jesus would go out onto the hillside to pray to his heavenly Father as he sought the mind and the will of, of his Father for the days ahead of him, I believe this is our opportunity as well. And I wonder, certainly as I examine my own heart, is there a possibility that some of us have become so attached or devoted to something other than Him, other than our head? Is there a possibility that we have become devoted to something other than His will? Is there a possibility that that we, like the Old Testament people of God, have been found going through the motions mechanically, but like in the days of Ezekiel, the presence of God had departed and with it his power and his blessing. May the Lord help us personally and corporately in this time of seeking him to refocus our minds, to refocus our hearts, to refocus our wills towards that which ultimately and eternally matters. May our eyes be turned from looking at the vain things, at false things, at things that don't matter. And may we found with our eyes looking towards Him. Well, brethren, if we're going to reach North America, there's this 500 million. Um, Jesus is going to have to call all the shots. Uh, he, he doesn't need our, our clever schemes. He doesn't need our bright ideas. Um, he needs us to just do what he says. Um, we need to get on his page, not the other way around. We don't need to bring him to get him to buy into our vision. He shares his heart with them. He says to them, I have compassion. All around us, the, the, the sea of humanity wandering on the mountains of sin and error. All around us, blinded by the God of this age. Um, they don't need my compassion. They need the Lord's compassion. 
and I cannot artificially manufacture this compassion. This characteristic of the Lord Jesus can only be supernaturally formed in us through abiding in Him. North America doesn't need more evangelists as, as much as it needs more men and women that are conformed to the image of God's Son, more Christ-likeness among the people of God. The more I am by God's Holy Spirit conformed into the image of who His Son is, the more I will be mission-minded, the more evangelistic I will be. Brethren, we need to adopt the Lord Jesus' assessment of our spiritual condition. Oh, how we need to be like the Lord. Oh, how we need His heart. How we need to be like Him. To see the plight of perishing millions and hell hath enlarged its mouth. In the words of Isaiah. Um, God doesn't need our strength. Whether that come in the form of bright ideas, whether it mean our, our laborious spiritual activity, our... No, no, God needs our weakness. As Spurgeon said, God doesn't need your strength. He needs your weakness because he's got lots of strength, but he doesn't got any weakness. We can hold a lot more with an empty hand presented to the Lord than with a tightly closed fist holding on to that which we're unwilling to give up. Is it costly for local churches to send out faithful brothers? Think about the church at Antioch. You're sending out Barnabas, the son of encouragement. And you're sending out the one who is the apostle born out of due time. It's costly. And perhaps one element that I'm prone to forget as I read through the, the journeys here in Acts is how often Paul and his companions episterizoed. And then this word sterizo, which follows, um, can be translated multiple different ways um, to confirm, to establish, to concretely set fast. It means to resolutely fix and to be fully supported. At the end of Missionary Journey 1, they went back through the churches of Galatia and they episterizo the disciples. The goal, the win of the Great Commission is that disciples are made that they themselves are going out and making disciples. Praise God for Philip the Evangelist going out, but praise God as well for men like Barnabas, the son of encouragement, going to Antioch, strengthening, encouraging those disciples, recognizing we need more teachers and getting teachers there until Antioch was established and it's the sending forth church. And Paul's mindset was unless they come to fullness, unless they come to maturity, unless they themselves aren't just rooted in Christ, but built up and established in him, it's in vain. They made disciples, and those disciples went out with it and made disciples who made more disciples, a ministry of multiplication. And we ought to pray tonight, not just that the gospel would go forward, but that disciples would be made. It's hard to send out laborers if they're little babes in Christ. And we ought to pray for the furtherance of the gospel, the fellowship of the gospel, but also for discipleship, fullness of faith, fully established As we live the Christian life, we find that there are lots of problems. We say, Lord, our problems are great. And it's interesting that all down through the history of the men of God, the problems have been great. Job said that man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. So problems are not without benefit. They tend to make our heart soft, and when our heart gets soft, we tend to long more for the Savior and the blessings that He will bring. Lord, make us glad according to the days wherein Thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. And we're longing for the benefits and the blessings that come from the uh, delay that we have. Return, O Lord, how long? And let it, let it repent thee concerning thy servants. We're longing for the Lord to come because of the great problems we have. But there's another reason for the longing, and that is because of the greatness of our weakness. And it seems that the longer we go in the Christian life, we notice that our strength becomes weaker, but his strength in us 
become stronger. What do you do when you're weak? What do you do when the problems are great? You pray. What do you pray for? Why we pray for the intervention of the Lord, for the coming of the Lord in the midst of our situation today, and for his soon return uh, to resolve all the issues that are before us. We long for the Lord's return, not just because our problems are great, but because we are very, very weak. The longer we serve him, the more we understand about the greatness of his glory. We look back and we see what God has done. And we get very, very excited. And we say, Lord, you've done all these wonderful things. I want to see, I want to see you in the present. I want to see you far more closely than I have seen you. We're looking for the blessed hope. We're looking for the glorious appearing because of all the wonderful things he's done for us. We've seen so much of his glory. We long to see more. Our problems are great. Our strength is weak. His glory is glorious. We want more, we say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. O our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. We have issues that we could never, we could never overcome. And so we are calling on God to act decisively. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down and act decisively in our day. Their eyes are upon the God that they desperately need. And I just want to say that this must be a lifestyle for the people of God. It must be. This has to be something that gives birth to an ongoing life of purposeful, dedicated focus on Christ, on God. We must have a heart to follow after His, His call. God does call. God has called. God still calls His followers to do incredible things. It, it's simply this, that we need to obey and go toward the fight in utter dependence upon God. We are believing God to bring about His New Testament heart for our generation. Namely, that He would conform the church to the scriptures. I call that revival, a newfound biblical conformity. And that He would move in His power to bring us from where we are, falling short, and that He would snap us in His power back to where we always should have been, starting with me, starting with me, starting with me. We're not asking that our will would be done on earth as His will is done in heaven. We're asking that His will would be fully accomplished in our day for His glory alone. That we must go forward believing Him. We go forward in utter dependence upon Him. The just shall live by faith. May the Lord help us personally and corporately in this time of seeking him to refocus our minds, to refocus our hearts, to refocus our wills towards that which ultimately and eternally matters. May our eyes be turned from looking at the vain things, at false things, at things that don't matter. And may we found with our eyes looking towards him the Father spoke from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. What wonderful approbation from heaven. Heaven declares the worthiness of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is worthy to receive all things. He is worthy.